Okay. Well, hello. My name is Marcus K. Jones. I'm a director. I work mostly in the fashion and beauty space. I've done projects for companies like Clinique, CoverGirl, Avon, Tresemme, uh, Hugo Boss, uh, Michael Kors, Red Ken Target, um, good number of Estee Lauder companies, Hervé Leger. Uh, and what I want to talk about today is something that seems to, no matter what the level of project uh, seems to be, um, how to deal with its budget. Um, frankly, I can make this lecture series very, very short if you want to know what is the cheapest thing you can do. The cheapest thing you can do is take a selfie. And quite literally, uh, there's a fair amount of Instagram marketing that basically consists of people taking selfies featuring whatever they're selling. And that's it. And that's as cheap as it gets. That said, uh, content creators such as myself um, you know, are working just you know, a couple of notches above that and still, you know, we'll always be faced uh, with simple questions um, about how we're going to deliver a quality image um, on a project's budget. So what it really comes down to, when you're looking to, to do something on budget, you need to be very clear with yourself and your team and your treatment with the client about what you're trying to create. Um, because it's the variances of an idea that end up being expensive. The simplest form of ideas can normally be executed at a decent price. You just need to make sure that you've cut out the fat. So any project begins with a lot of research and a lot of communication. Uh, skipping past research or communication will indefinite, you know, inevitably lead to a problem down the road. So generally, I start my projects by doing a lot of uh, research and compiling references, images that in one way or another speak to what I want to create, that establish a precedent for the type of media. Um, ideally, they you know, will also give me insight into how well these, the type of imagery will be received. You know, if there's a potential audience for it, um, you know, what, what's got in fans, what's got in attention. Um, it's always a great, you know, it's fun to do stuff that's, you know, that's edgy, that's editorial. Um, my background is very commercial uh, and I mostly work in a commercial space. So it's not common that I'm just going to create, you know, an image that nobody's ever seen before. Um, because I don't usually work with uh, teams that are asking for that type of imagery. Usually they want a very clear, uh, recognizable presentation of their brand. So after I've you know, done my research and I've gathered you know, a lot of references about where something can go, what I like to do is, is I like to distill the simplest form of an idea. That's key. Um, with that information, uh, literally post it at the top of your bulletin board, you can navigate decisions and, and, and uh, establish what's priority and what can go to the side. Um, the next thing that's very important is to understand how light sources work. If you've got a thorough understanding of light, you can figure out where you can cut corners. Light is usually one of the more expensive things on a given budget. The cameras have gotten incredibly cheap. If nothing else, we have our cell phones and cell phones and selfies and you know the rear facing camera, all these cameras are very effective tools. So the camera cost is not something that I particularly evaluate anymore, really, um, unless there are specifications on the client's end. Uh, and that's why I always say try to simplify the camera and ask yourself, why am I choosing this camera? Is it because I want it? Or is it because something that the client needs? And <laughs> those aren't always aligned. So to go into more depth uh, about clearing mean clear and meaningful references, I'm actually going to pull uh, some references from projects that I've done. Um, the first of which is a job that I did for CoverGirl. Um, this was a job uh, where CoverGirl was um, launching uh, two new brand ambassadors who are DJ duo called Nervo. Uh, 
uh, Nervo's Australian base, Tiesto backed, um, you know, really blew up, had a huge following. And for that reason, CoverGirl decided to make them brand ambassadors. Uh, at the top of the project, um, one of the things that I wanted to make sure off the bat was, okay, who are these girls? How can I make them look amazing? Um, that always comes first with my work. Uh, you don't want to be the first person who put somebody on screen looking not as great as they were on a previous project. I mean, once standards have been set, you need to meet them or you need to exceed them. Um, so when it came to uh, this research, the first thing I did was find every image I could find of them, taken by every photographer, every video, every music video, you know, to get a good sense of what worked. Um, and the next thing that I needed to find out is what, what is their environment and what environment do we want to show them in? Uh, they're DJs. They do huge sets, um, you know, sophisticated lighting, you know, great events, great production. Um, and that was something that seemed to be part, you know, part of their, their brand and their identity. Uh, and I wanted that to come across in the project. So, you know, that's literally about color. It's about flares. It's about, you know, a sharpness to the image. Um, so I went about gathering, you know, references of, of flares and backlight and different types of colors um, and started pacing together, uh, you know, bits that spoke to, you know, how that could be applied in the project that I wanted to create. Um, in this particular case, I also, you know, discovered in my research that they look great when shot with a ring light. Um, Google it great tool. Uh, it makes a lot of people look wonderful. It's somewhat limiting, but if you walk into, you know, the situation with, you know, a clear understanding of how the ring light works and how to make it uh, perform its best, I mean, it could be a great tool. In the other direction, uh, I worked on a project with, well, several products with Clinique. And uh, Clinique is, you know, a brand that's very established in their imagery. Um, you know, they're clean, uh, they're very simple. Uh, they prefer, you know, to work with, with white backgrounds and, and, and very simplified lighting. Um, in this particular case, we were looking to do something in studio that felt like daylight. We wanted a very sharp, crisp look to the imagery. Um, in this particular case, uh, it came down to finding a very small source of light, um, positioning it directly over the camera, as simple as it may be. Um, and just bring in at an intensity that, you know, that worked well for the talent, but also uh, worked well for the camera. But the research on this project was very simple. Clinique doesn't, you know, doesn't vary too much from, you know, the core brand identity. But the research was necessary because if I had gone in there just suggesting all kinds of things, it wouldn't have been right. Uh, another brand, um, wanted to do uh, for their fall campaign um, imagery that sort of took place in, you know, uh, wheat fields and had sort of a middle America, you know, vibe to it. Um, for this, I had to, you know, really get a clear understanding of what that meant. Um, you know, if somebody says, oh, well, you know, we, we imagine grass and we imagine, you know, the fall, uh, there's a lot of ambiguity there. So this, you know, consisted of compiling what ended up being a couple of hundred images at first, and really picking through to figure out, you know, what spoke, uh, what spoke best to their brand. Um, on a project that I worked on recently, this was for a, uh, a television show um, I connected to a beauty brand. Um, there was already a lot of existing imagery in play. And... Uh, though none of it had been, you know, made available yet, uh, the, the consistent image of the show needed to be maintained in the advertising campaign. So that began in a, you know, essentially grabbing screenshots, you know, looking for patterns in lighting, um, seeing, you know, what type of, you know, what if any effects, you know, the DPs and the, and the um, production designers were doing. You know, I found prevalence of flares, of backlight, of fog, um, you know, a lot of use of color and needed to figure out a way to interpret that for the beauty brand uh, that was going to be 
sponsoring this. So it was a bit of a translate translation game um, where I needed to put together boards that spoke to uh, a couple of lighting moments. Um, one of the lighting moments sort of in the, in the top right uh, explains how, uh, how the beauty lighting would work. Um, you know, you see there the show references on the left are, you know, they're very moody, um, which is cool. Uh, they're very contrasty, which is also cool. But when it comes to makeup, uh, you need to see it. Ultimately, um, makeup is something where, uh, where color and wild, you know, wild editorial lighting can end up working, working against you. Um, so I had to figure out how I was going to make that fit within the right world. Um, and also, there were a couple of other scenes within the project uh, where you know, the requirements varied a little bit and we were able to play with more color or with less light. Um, but in the end, these references all go to communicate with you know, those at the ad agency and those, you know, those within your team and those with the various marketing companies to be very clear about what you're going to create. Ultimately, uh, you, don't want, you don't want to introduce surprises. Um, and this is when it comes down to distilling the simplest form of the idea. You know, what are you making? Uh, what's most important to you? And making sure that throughout the budget process and before, throughout the lighting process, that that remains at the forefront. And generally, it's something that can be you know, defined in one sentence um, to help you figure out what's essential. Uh, one method I, I particularly like to use is I like to, uh, I like to overbuild things. I like to say a lot about stuff and then just boil it down. Um, so, you know, some examples when, you know, I was doing the Nervo product, I said, well, I'm going to create a DJ concert. And as I went through the production process, I kept asking myself, does it look like, you know, they're in a set right now? Um, with Clinique is I want to show beauty and sharp daylight shot in studio. Uh, with this other brand, it was, I want to capture the essence of a fall season and making sure that as we explored the Midwestern imagery and the grass and, and, uh, the plateaus and the steps, making sure that it felt like fall when it could easily slip into another season. Um, and in the case of this most recent show, it was, I wanted to transform an actress into a movie star. Um, so making sure that I was true to that process was essential. Um, when going through the references, you often find that there are similarities in the, you know, items that you tend to gravitate to. Uh, and those are what I call sort of the recognizable characteristics. You know, what is it about this image that, you know, that speaks to, that speaks to your board? Um, also looking at variations on things, you know, for example, uh, if I were to talk about the Nervo piece, um, there are, you know, another way that I could have done that is I could have done it just with, uh, with, you know, Lico's in stage lights, um, kind of coming and flashing in different ways. And that would have, that would have worked that, you know, definitely would have said DJ set. Um, but I needed to evaluate the effectiveness of doing that in the, in the context of beauty. Um, and in this particular case, you know, using multiple sources coming on and off at different times was going to distract from the makeup in the end. Um, but one of the things that's really important, just kind of as you go through this process and, you know, make sure you're true to your idea is, you know, figuring out whether or not uh, fitting into a cliche works to your advantage or not. Um, it often does in advertising. Advertising is very cliche, and that's for a reason. It's okay. Um, but the advertising that many of us appreciate uh, feels familiar, but it's distinctly different. And really what that's about is that's hybridization. That's about finding two things that are quite familiar, but normally aren't married together, and then placing those together. Um, so whenever you see the opportunity to do that, it's always good to present. Um, what I like to do is I like to overbuild. Uh, and then distill things down to the simplest form. You know, I like to place, you know, I use a piece of software called OmniGraffle and I put tons and tons of images up on, on my boards uh, along with, you know, handwritten notes and, you know, all of my ideas together um, in just sort of one field of view. Because I think that it's important, 
you know, early in the process and as kind of checkpoints throughout to go through and to re-familiarize yourself with these images. Because you may find as new sort of budgetary elements present themselves that some things become more relevant than others. Uh, sometimes an image or a reference that in the beginning you threw out uh, becomes a new reality. Um, and, you know, I, I like to spend a moment trying to figure out, okay, so if I really like a given reference, like what is it that makes this reference tick? You know, is it, is it the particular pose of the person? Is it a demeanor? Is it a camera move? Is it lighting? Um, because establishing that helps you kind of see past what's irrelevant in the image and also helps you communicate with others. You know, quite often uh, I see something that I think is, you know, that's great, a, a fantastic reference. I, you know, I say, oh my gosh, you know, the way, the way this lighting is coming across her, um, I think is really strong and I think, you know, makes the beauty pop. Um, and that's why I like the reference. But my client may not see the same thing. They say, yeah, but, the, you know, I don't think I want to shoot this in a car. And the whole time I'm thinking to myself, oh, I had no idea that when looking at this reference, they were seeing a, a girl sitting in a car thinking, I don't want to shoot a girl in a car. I'm looking at, you know, the, the attitude of the girl and the way the light's falling on her. So once you figure out kind of what makes it tick for you, uh, simple thing to do, just take your Photoshop brush tool and black out the rest, you know, and then kind of re-look at it, represent that reference and, you know, see if it's a better way to communicate with people. And lastly, I always like to revisit my one sentence and it's one, one sentence intention to make sure that it's, um, it, it's all fitting together. So when it comes to understanding light sources, this is where you can begin to really save money. Um, a lot of beauty and fashion is actually very, very simple when it comes to the cost of lighting, the type of tools that you can use, and the number of units that you need. Um, as you've distilled your references and hopefully uh, sort of sorted out what references speak to lighting in particular, um, you can begin to evaluate what types of sources are going to be most effective in your presentation. Um, when it comes, comes to daylight, it's usually pretty simple. You can shoot a person uh, in the shade, like uh, the blonde woman in the sunglasses to the left. You can shoot a person with a sunlight behind them, which is you know pretty common, uh, and a large white bounce source in the front. Or you can shoot a person in direct sunlight. Um, that's pretty much as cheap as it gets with lighting. I mean, in the shade, most expensive thing is a bounce guard. Uh, you really can't go wrong. Nice thing about beauty and fashion is that it's, yes, it's about lighting, but the tools involved in the lighting aren't very, very expensive. It's about having a compel compelling subject, compelling styling, compelling makeup. Um, quite often I shoot in studio. And, you know, when I'm going through references, I like to evaluate uh, what sources were used in the references that I've found. Um, cool thing about this studio lighting in particular and beauty studio lighting is all you have to do is zoom in quite a bit and look at the person's eyeball and look at the shadow by their nose and you can figure out how things are done. Um, and the example on the left, uh, you know, when you look in pretty closely there, you can see it's done with a beauty dish uh, that's circular and probably a, a rectangular bounce card just below her chin. Um, another thing you can tell right away is that the chin has no shadow to it, uh, just reinforcing that it's not just the top source. Um, in the image of Adele, uh, you can see that not only is the uh, is there you know the beauty dish and the bounce card, but you can tell by the position over the eyeball where it was placed, um, and reinforce that opinion by looking at the small shadow on the nose. Uh, that simple, one light and a bounce card. I don't know how to make it cheaper. Some people use a flash source at the bottom, but I think that that's most often overkill. Um, when it comes to you know other forms of studio lighting and editorial and fashion, you know it it doesn't vary that much in the end. You know these are again you know two light source references. The girl on the, on the left side, you can see it in her eyeball. Uh, she's got a relatively sh strong dominant key, probably an octobank or perhaps a breezy um, off to her side, and it looks like there might just be a little bit of fill, or otherwise it could be a card just coming to the other side of her face, just lifting the shadows just a bit. Um, recognizing that fashion and beauty are often one light source, uh, you know, areas means that you can off the bat know you don't have to spend a ton on it. You don't need to, you know, grab 
a huge kit. And you don't need to have a huge crew to support that kit. You can do a lot with very little. Uh, and the best, you know, the best lighting is simple. The best lighting does its job to bring the compelling subject to the foreground um, and not draw, draw attention to itself as lighting. Uh, these types of sources are, are a little bit more stylized, but also very simple when you take a look at it. Um, on the left, you have probably a, you know, a larger source at one exposure. And then uh, just above her face, there's probably a very, very well diffused, perhaps, you know, with a, um, uh, well, just one, one form of diffusion or another, um, just giving additional light to her face. And that's really all there is to it. And, and quite often, it's a great way to make, you know, deep colors pop. You know, I love the way that looks, especially if you have a, a deeper, you know, liquid eyeliner uh, or deeper lipstick. When you just, you know, clip the skin just a little bit, it really makes those colors stronger. Um, and then to the source of the right, uh, you know, it's a Richardson-esque photo. Uh, simple as it can get, it's a camera flash. And it's great. And if you want to shoot a camera flash, one of the, you know, one of the great ways to do it, put a nice big diffuser on it just above the lens and put your subject right against a wall. So the flash is illuminating both the subject uh, and the wall itself. Similar things will work for the ring light. Um, so I, I always speak to one light because I don't like to confuse with key light. Um, you know, key light is normally a term that we use when speaking to our lighting team. Uh, one light is more of a philosophy, in my opinion. Um, whether or not I'm shooting with one light, eh, well, that depends. But my intentions are for it to feel like that because that feels right. Uh, with that said, I need to figure out how I can be consistent, you know, across the work day. Um, and when there are, you know, budgetary constraints, I have to also think about, okay, within my one light and how I want, you know, the characteristics I want that light to have, uh, what kind of unit alternatives, you know, might there be in the marketplace? Um, so when it comes to establishing what that one light is, research comes into play again. You need to know who you're shooting um, and what's worked with them. Most of the time, uh, you're going to be, you know, the hundredth photographer or director of photography to have lit this person. Um, and sometimes they might even come with guidelines for how they like to be shot. Um, so, you know, understanding, you know, what works for that person will determine the type of unit that they use. Uh, some faces, you know, that are that are rounder look really good with, you know, a small uh, distant source and very little fill light clocked off 30 degrees. That looks great on them. The, you know, the shadow gives them a little bit of contouring. Um, you know, their faces can, can handle usually just as far as the skin texture and such, uh, can handle the detail that comes from, you know, the added shadow, shadow detail that comes from a smaller source. Um, people with uh, more chiseled faces, um, do well, you know, often in softer light, larger sources. Uh, these sources don't need to necessarily be expensive at all, and I'll get into that. Um, and, you know, when looking at that, you know, revisit what the simplest form of the idea is over and over again. Um, sometimes you might find out that, you know, all your talk about lighting has already put you astray. Uh, and then, you know, I sort of evaluate the desired quality of light. Um, and I kind of already spoke to that, you know, large sources, small sources, uh, but ultimately, you know, soft versus hard, uh, large versus small are kind of the key parameters that I work through. Figuring out how to be consistent across your day uh, is, is very, very tricky. And I'll tell you, when it comes to lighting, especially on location, a lot of the campaigns that are just spectacular were shot in a very short window of time when the light is right on a great weather day. And sometimes people have, you know, productions are scheduled to be there for more than just the shoot day, just a couple of days adjacent to the date, just in case to get that excellent lighting. Uh, when it comes to locations, you know, I, I like to have a good realistic conversation with my client. You know, if, if we've distilled a lot of imagery that's, 
that's sunset based or, you know, where the sun is, is acting as a, as a background flare, I'll like say, okay, well, you know, realistically, we've got two or three hours to shoot this entire campaign. Um, when, you know, we're looking at imagery that's shade based, you know, that's, that's great. Uh, the only time you can't shoot is around noon. You can find shade and shadow area, whether the sun be on the east or the west, you know, throughout the day and identifying where those locations could be during your scout. It uh, will save you a big headache. You know, okay, morning time, we've got, you know, a great, great shade coming off this building over here or coming off these trees over here. So we're going to work in this area and, you know, we're going to break for lunch. And then for the second half of the day, this is where we're going to find our shade sources. Uh, when it comes to the direct light, you know, it it's not only an evaluation of how you're going to, you know, when you're going to have the right direct light on your subject, but also on your background and the environment. You know, usually your references are indicating to you whether or not you want an environment that has, you know, a portion of shadow, a lot of shadow, none at all. Um, you need to figure out how to be consistent about that. Um, so looking for, you know, the right spots, looking for uh, places where you can get good backlight or great shade are sort of part of that scout process. Um, in studio, it's a lot, it's a lot more simple. I do mostly, most of my work is in studio. Um, I do, you know, a fair amount of high volume work, but more often it's the complexities that come along with making a video uh, that make the studio a better environment. Quite frankly, video takes a while. And I mean, no news to people who make videos. Sometimes it, you know, it can become a burden uh, to teams that are used to working with, you know, with photographers and with, with still production companies. Um, but given the length of the day, uh, particularly in beauty when you know the expectations for precision are very high uh, working in studio is a favorable scenario so you know there are tricks that you can employ i mean i am uh very you know precise once i've determined you know the height of my light the angle on the subject the distance um that's something that usually i nod off with the length of rope uh to make sure that you know at no point you know during a rebuild of the set or a maneuver, a maneuver to a different area, has my, my key source or any of my other sources changed in their distance, height, or angle on the subject. Um, I like to, you know, carefully evaluate, especially if I'm using, you know, an egg crate or, you know, light modification tools that, you know, affect intensity based on the angle they, they, uh, they arrive at the subject on. You know, I like to, some people actually use as a tool, I, the name of it escapes me, but effectively it, it measures angles. And, you know, that's one way of being precise. Um, checking the focus of the light is very important. Uh, any light will give you different characteristics based on whether or not it's, it's more flooded or more spot uh, with breezy, you know, the position of the tube uh, within the fixture, you know, affects the quality of light in numerous ways. So you want to you know, take careful note of these things and make sure that throughout your day you're being consistent. Um, and then, you know, the last measurement that you'll take repeatedly is your metering. Ultimately, all of our eyes sort of fatigue throughout the day. What's, when it comes to keeping your costs down, um, there isn't a bigger cost that you can come across in a production than overtime. And having a game plan when you go in there for how you're going to be consistent uh, keeps you out of the trenches where you're having to, um, you know, keep people longer, go back, reshoot things, uh, when you're having to move around the schedule in ways that you hadn't planned for. A big way to save money uh, is to consider lighting alternatives. So a real work story from just last week, um, I do a lot, of my, a lot of my material in the breezy light. I think that, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic unit. You know, a lot of people love working with it. Very popular unit. It's come down quite a bit in price. It's become a lot more available in the New York area. Um, but this shoot took place abroad and I got the, the price of a breezy for two days and in New York for reference, it's about 2,500 bucks. Maybe you could get it for two grand less. If you've got a good connection, it was 15,000 for two days. That was more than my lighting budget for those two days. And when I saw that number, I mean, I double, I triple checked it. I was looking at the exchange rates and I was trying to figure out how this could be. Uh, I even considered flying one in from LA, you know, cause it seemed like the price of that, well, it was still going to be 10 grand. I'm just like how on earth could this light be so expensive? 
And in light of that, I had to think, okay, so why have I selected the breezy light for this project? Um, and what other light sources might do a similar job? In the end, I want my key lights to be circular. I don't know why. Uh, I have shot, you know, with Kinos, with Image 80s, uh, with, you know, every type of, of you know, four by eight by six by whatever by um, and consistently found that a round source somehow works best for beauty. Um, so that was primary reason why I gravitated towards it. Uh, the next thing I was thinking about was the size. Um, I took a look at my subjects. Uh, my subjects were relatively young and, you know, their skin was, uh, had very little detail to it. So I realized, you know what, I could probably get away with a smaller source here. And I remembered when I originally ordered the Breezy is because I didn't know who my subjects were going to be. I happened to put it on reserve at the beginning, but a week before production, it was like, okay, so do you really need this $15,000 unit? Um, at which point, you know, I discovered, okay, well, there's, you know, pro photo beauty dishes might actually do the trick here. And, you know, do I want a silver? Do I want a white? Or do I want an off brand that makes a larger size or such? Well, in this case, I just ordered it all. But the price of all of these, all these different reflectors was not going to reach anywhere near, you know, what I was going to possibly hit with this breezy. So, you know, circles matter, but there's a lot of different types. Um, there's a lot of different brands that make them. I'm not going to pretend to be an appendix for every piece of equipment out there because it seems to change daily. Um, but, you know, that said, go to b and hs website. Um, one of the things that comes up all the time is, okay, well, can we use some LEDs? And oftentimes there's a strong inclination to use HMIs. Uh, and there are practical and cost applications, you know, imp implications of both of these. I mean, LEDs uh, are... I still approach an LED light with suspicion. I, I have a color meter, which is important. Um, I think that anybody working in beauty has to have a color meter. Uh, if a vendor tells you, oh, our, our bulbs are brand new, the light should be white. Well, what is white on the Kelvin spectrum? How far is, you know, how far is the green magenta shift? Um, it really, it's to be determined. I mean, young bulbs don't, a young bulb, a brand new bulb out the box isn't necessarily what you want. Quite oftentimes when I'm working with a joker, for example, I ask to have a range of bulbs. I ask for them to send me their oldest bulb, one that's sort of in the midlife and a brand new one. Uh, because each of those are going to have different color characteristics. Uh, when I'm working with LEDs, I have to measure them. I have to test them. And I have to consider how many I'm going to use. Two LEDs from the same manufacturer, just like two jokers, two HMIs, they're not going to be the same. And LEDs can have some, some awful characteristics, specifically when it comes to green and magenta. That'll show up in anybody's skin, especially somebody with white skin. Um, so I'm very, very careful about that. That said, if you need to use an LED and you've got the money, the best one, hands down, Airy makes a sky panel. Uh, I think the 30-inch the or the, the S30 or whatever is, is a great unit. The 60 is also a great unit. Um, and when it comes to HMIs, I mean, you know, I've always used Airy HMIs, but it's anybody's pick. I mean, HMIs, first of all, they flicker. And quite often in fashion, we want a tight shutter angle because we often want to grab stills from our video. Uh, we want to do a lot of slow motion. Um, a crisp image is kind of part of the delivery. So, you know, on very big jobs, on my Hugo Boss job, if anybody cared to see, there's, there's a flicker there. And the flicker, believe it or not, uh, wasn't the unit. The flicker was an inconsistency in the power source that fed the studio. And this is one of New York's most expensive studios. Um, I spoke to a number of electricians who confirmed, yeah, you know what, sometimes the voltage varies just a bit in the building. There's nothing you can do about that. And the voltage varying affects uh, whether or not an HMI is going to be a consistent source. So before you go off and get that really expensive HMI, think about it. Think about, do you need it? Do you need the output? Do you need to be in a blue color? Obviously, there's, you know, uh, sensors do well with daylight. They're all calibrated to daylight, but you got to think about that. Um, before you just say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with these LEDs because they're super cheap. Think about how it's going to affect you in post. You might end up in a situation where you don't have access to a colorist who can make the changes. You don't have the time to make the changes. And all of those can vastly uh, outprice the cost of a light better than that cheap LED that you found. Um, when you're in a situation where you do need to use 
uh, two different units, um, as I often find myself in. Uh, I, you know, my go-to is to, uh, I like to work in tungsten first. Um, generally, tungsten has a more continuous spectrum. Um, the, uh, just by the fact that you're talking about, a, 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 you know, a filament that is, you know, maintaining a certain amount of output um, over time, regardless of the electrical cycle, uh, you're not going to deal with the same kind of flickering and you're going to be able to do whatever shutter angle you want to do. You're going to be able to do any still pulls that you want. Um, that's going to end up working very well for you in the back end. You're going to have great skin tones. Um, I had, you know, recent positive experience with uh, Profoto makes a tungsten air. Um, its unit comes in a 500 watt uh, bulb, it comes in a 1000 watt bulb. Um, very inexpensive, not all that popular, so do call ahead uh, to get access to it. But if you're working with beauty dishes, it's fantastic. Um, before this unit, I worked primarily uh, with jokers using a crossover adapter. Jokers have come down quite a bit in price. Um, beware, the bulbs uh, that are on the market, and especially in the New York City uh, area, I mean, are at every different place in their life cycle. So if you if you make an order, chances are that you're going to get bulbs that are just all different ages and all different colors. You know, pack with you um, your color correction gels, which come down to precision of you know an ace, but that still might not be good enough. Um, my solution when I'm working with either either of those units, and even when I'm working with Breezy, let me not say that Breezy is amazing. If you're working with a Breezy H2 or H5 tungsten, that's as good as you can get. I mean you're gonna get great light from that. But even then, are you landing closer to 32 or you're landing closer to 35 Kelvin? You don't know and when it's time to use your second source. My recommendation, try to get uh, an area sky panel. The area sky panels will let you dial in variations in the color temperature and in the, uh, in the tent with fantastic pre uh, precision. Um, numerically, on the back of the unit, yes, it'll tell you, okay, this is exactly 3300 Kelvin with, you know, uh, this fraction of a magenta shift. Um, in the end, I do two things. One, I take out my light meter, my color temperature meter to be precise. Um, and, you know, I, I evaluate where that is. And if you don't have that, a great way to do things, take up your two units, put a, uh, just a, sh a big, you know, V flat or something in front of them. Uh, and ideally have a white wall behind that. Take your two units like this, and you're, you cross light that V-flat behind it, you're going to get cross shadows. If you look into those shadows, uh, that amount of brightness is going to allow the eye to perceive the differences in color temperature, and especially in green magenta shift. So you can save yourself a lot of time and headache if you don't have the tools by just going like that. Um, from there, you can you know, make whatever gel corrections you need uh, you know, to help out. Um, I should have said earlier, just when you're making these evaluations, make sure that the light's been on for a while because they shift consistently over time. I like to make my evaluations after the light's been on at least 20 minutes. If it's already warm and I'm just restriking, I can reevaluate after only a few minutes, but temperature affects everything. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot to think about there. Uh, when you have a client that's, you know, that sees your lighting order and they cry poor, you can always just get on the same page. Your best bet, I found, is to go ahead and, and figure out how much they want to spend. And if it's a number where at least you're being paid, you know, what you want to be paid, uh, usually there's a way for you to make the rest of the project cheaper. And lighting is a great way to do that. Oftentimes, the things that are most important to me are not all that important to the client. Sometimes I think I, I, I need to be able to shoot all day. No, actually, the client just needs a couple of images that could easily be done within that two-hour window of great daylight and it'd be much better for them if you just schedule it then. Pick a day with great weather. Never mind all I said about jokers and, and breezies and all this. Go out into direct sunlight and get your image. It works quite well. You, it's amazing what you can be, can, can be done when you and your client are clear about what's important to them. Uh, and the last thing that you can do if you're not so much in the beauty space and all this color precision means nothing to you, you just need attitude, you need compelling character, you need a compelling scene, consider you know the value of existing sources. I mean. Go to Times Square. Campaigns, big campaigns do that. It's amazing you know, how many national campaigns uh, are not shy about shooting environments like Times Square because there's all this different, you know, there's all this different color light that's falling under subject. You can keep the Bubba Gump shrimp out of frame if you don't want it to be red as Times Square. Um, and there are spots all throughout. A bus stop 
is actually a great place to shoot because there are the giant, you know, backlit uh, fluorescent advertisements um, that oftentimes don't have any material on them and you're just getting a light. The color of that light could be whatever. It might be just way wrong. But if that's not important to you, that type of light might be good for you. Uh, there's a lot that can be done. I, I think it's great when I can shoot under mercury vapor lamps. I love street lamps. It's a shame. Well, ecologically, it's great that we're all going to LEDs, but mercury vapor and those ugly kind of yellow lights make a great scene. So looking for opportunities to work with those type of practicals is okay. If you're clear with your client about what's important to them and all this color talk is not part of the story, it's really about, it's about fashion, it's about uh, attitude, it's about creating a moment and, you know, and a feel. You know, sometimes that it might work out better for you um, to consider some existing sources. Um, with all that said, the camera is something that uh, that should quite often play a background role in what you're trying to create. Um, if you haven't, you know, figured it out already, uh, a lot can be done with very little. It's painful, quite quite literally, to see even Apple's campaign with the iPhones. You know, where they're like, you know, let's let's just shot on iPhone. Okay. Hasselblad. I mean, that, that was hard on a lot of us, you know, uh, I, you know, I own red. I have for many years. The equipment's worked very well for me. I understand it. I can get the best imagery from it. Um, Alexa is a fantastic machine as well. And it's got, you know, a fantastic sensor that's been you know consistent and a go-to for a lot of people. But in the end, you know, the price of these things may or may not fit within the scope of, of, you know, what you're trying to create here. Make sure that you're getting paid. Make sure that you're not spending all of your money on equipment. Quite oftentimes, a client comes to you and says, hey, listen, I got a X number of thousands of dollars to do this. And you look at them and you say, you know what? How am I going to pay for anything? Ask yourself a question. What if I paid for nothing? It's a great way to run a business. And it, frankly, it's the way a lot of businesses run. They say, okay, well, how much would we like to make on this project? And after that's settled, we'll determine how much we're going to spend on our various expenses. Um, and as a content creator, it's important to do that. Everybody is. So once you establish, you know, kind of what your lighting is and you you can start to evaluate what your camera options are. Quite oftentimes, um, you're better to take a stance from, you know what, I'm going to go from the most conservative uh, approach to camera. I'm going to put it on a tripod or I'm going to do handheld. And then any variation on that, I'm actually going to make a case for that. And this comes back to research. This is why research is so important. Um, you go you go back, you kind of see, all right, the references that I've seen, the videos that I've seen, what's made them great? Was it the camera movement? Was there any camera movement? Which I've often found things that I, I swore were full of, you know, energy and movement. It's actually just cuts. Actually, it's great moments and it's great scenes. It's compelling characters, fantastic fashion, impeccable beauty, and a camera on a tripod. I found sometimes in fashion that, oh my gosh, but you know, they're, they're here and they're there and they went to five different cities and handheld, not steady cam, not movie, handheld. And it worked 30, 35 millimeter lens. Nobody can tell the difference. Hold it tight when you want to go 50 and above. Sometimes it's romantic to you, a little bit out of focus. It's amazing. These things are done very, very inexpensively. Um, and you know, when I think about the different technologies, I'm a Steadicam operator. I use Steadicam on, you know, as many of my products as I can. I've done great stuff with it. You know, I love the feel of it. But sometimes, you know, even that, even moving at all might work against you. Uh, and this is where I start to go back to who I'm shooting. Subjects really determine uh, how you can shoot them. Some people do not look good and don't want to be shot, explicitly will not be shot from certain angles. Um, especially higher profile subjects. You can't shoot them from the same. If you even set up your camera on that side of the face, their you know, handler is going to come up to you and just tell you to move that camera. So it's something to take in, you know, in mind when you're thinking about this and you're making your grand plan. Um, some people look great from one lens height. Uh, others, you know, uh, you can vary. I mean, one of the reasons why, um, you know, models get paid, what, well, Okay. Agents make sure that models get paid, what they get paid, um, is that they are people who can be shot from all different angles. And they offer a lot of versatility to the photographer. Um, quite oftentimes in beauty, I'm working with people who are, well, okay, let's see. 
it's 50-50. I work with a lot of models, but I also work with people that are famous for other reasons, that are actresses or uh, just, you know, people of interest, bloggers often come into play. And I, you know, I, I do my research and I try to find out, okay, like, do I really want to do that orbital shot around them or should I skip that? Maybe they're best frontal. Maybe I need to keep it slightly profiled. Maybe I need to be looking into the shadow part of the face because I will, when I look at them dead on and I'm seeing the brunt of the daylight across their entire face, they just go potato on me. Uh, so there's a lot to keep in mind, a lot of research. Don't be the guy, don't be the first guy or gal that, that makes a mistake. That said, uh, one technical thing that you do have to keep in mind is the sensitivity of the camera. This comes into play quite a bit, especially when it comes to light modification, the type of sources that you're going to use. Um, I shoot on RED. RED is not the fastest camera out there. I don't always need the fastest camera out there. Quite oftentimes, I need raw files, um, which you know has kept me close to RED for a while. Uh, if I have a lot of money, OK, Arri, Codex, pay for it. It's great. You know, fantastic image. It's solid. It's known all through Hollywood. Uh, you can get a, you know, a 3.2K image, which is good image. You know, uh, Red is delivering a healthy 6K image now. I did my last campaign in 6K. I was very happy with the color. Um, they have an 8K camera. They're, you know, the color science behind that is a bit in progress right now. But you know, give them some time. They'll figure it out. Uh, don't just jump right away um, until you understand you know, whether or not where it is in development is going to work for you. Fidelity is huge. If it's all about fidelity, the color has to be one-to-one. -one. It's a good case for an Alexa. Uh, the Alexa just you know, does a fantastic job at rendering you know, real-to-life imagery. Sometimes you might find that your project is best, where the money is best put, put it into the Alexa camera, go out in natural light, tone down your lighting budget a little bit. Sometimes that's a good place to be. Case in point, fur, leather, my gosh. Fur and leather uh, are essentially brown objects. Brown is ex very, very sensitive to any shift in green and magenta. And it's very sensitive to any shift in orange and blue. The brown that the designer made and exists in, re in, in reality, may you may not even be able to recover that in post if you've shot under the wrong light or with the wrong camera. I've done, you know, I've gotten great results with red. Um, I'll tell you, it's a little bit tougher in getting leather goods with red. You will have to be prepared in post. If you know that you don't have that, you know, six thousand plus dollars to work in post, okay. You may, you may make a good case for an Alexa. And you also may make a very good case for tungsten light if you're indoors. If you have to do, do leather, stay away from major mines, stay away from LEDs, unless you've got you know, the top, top stuff. Uh, compression plays a good role. If you find out that, you know, this isn't a piece, you know, I'm not shooting jewelry. I'm not shooting eyelashes. You know, I don't need that type of resolution. I'm shooting attitude. I'm shooting character. I'm shooting a famous person. You can afford some compression. Hell, on people, uh, compression is a good thing, less detail. Um, in that case, you know, you may want to play around with, you know, an A7S uh, or any of the other Sony cameras. Um, the C300 Mark II is a fantastic camera. I love it. Um, no, it's not raw. Yes, it's compressed. Yes, I can see the details of the compression. Sometimes I don't care. Sometimes I need to shoot in such dim light circumstances that I want to, don't want to do it on anything else besides this. C300 or an A7S. I personally find that A7S is kind of pushy in terms of, you know, how compact a, a, a body form I'm willing to go, go for. But, you know, C300 Mark II, it's very strong. Uh, you can get a good job done with that. Um, so, so coming back, I think I digressed a bit. Uh, one of the things that I like to like to figure out, you know, is make uh, excuse me, making a clear case. I must hit back. There we go. There we go. It all comes down to your to your delivery specifications. Quite oftentimes, things are delivered on the internet. Um, even then, that's not clear enough. YouTube is 4K. Uh, Vimeo is 4K. Um, other things that are being delivered as pre-roll are often done, you know, just in a 1080 because advertisers don't want 
you know, to risk people not waiting for a 4K delivery to, to, for it to download and to buffer. Um, if you're doing something on a smartphone, you know, 1080 is fine. Less is okay. Uh, sometimes speed is what it's all about. Um, this plays into how you shoot, by the way. If you know that you're delivering something on a, on a tablet or a smartphone, go easy on the wide shots. You know, make sure that whatever is important to the client, you know, is taking up a good 50% of the, of the sensor at the, at the time. Um, understanding those delivery specs is everything. On my last project, uh, I was leaning very hard towards Alex until I found out our delivery was going to be 4K and we needed to be able to do 25% of a punch in. Alexa died immediately. We had to go red on this one because um, I needed that 6K resolution to get in there and deliver a 4K, even though I was going to be punching in 25% sometimes. Um, but even then, I like to reevaluate, okay, so what is it? Is this something, you know, am I telling myself this? Or, you know, am I saying I have to go in 4K? Am I saying that I can't be compressed? Am I saying I don't need raw? Or is my client saying that? And in the end, we're running a business for somebody. Keeping their needs first is key. Uh, I have my preferences, and I just thought I'd share them. Uh, I love shooting on, you know, on the red. I like, you know, Dragon Sensor. I use the Skin Tone um, Optical Low Pass Filter. Uh, that ultimately renders a higher noise floor, uh, or is it lower? I can't remember. Basically, everything does become a little bit more noisy, but that's not always the most horrible thing for me. Um, noise can be cleaned up. So I'll dial it up to 1600. What does that allow me to do? It allows me to keep in mind what's most important to my subjects which is how bright the light is on their face. Um, I have a goal, you know, the, the tech is going to be there in a year or two, but I want to be able to shoot beauty with completely dilated pupils. I think that's, you know, that is, that's a fantastic image. You know, when two people look at themselves, look at each other, uh, in close proximity in a romantic setting, you know, pupils are dilated, the color of the eye becomes more distinct because you've got the heavy block in the center. Um, as you put more light in a person, you know, the pupils constrict and, you know, the, the effect may or may not feel the way that you want to. Uh, so for that reason, you're, you're going to want to do some tests and figure out, you know, what feels comfortable on your subject. Um, sensors, they want to have a daylight image. I like to shoot on tungsten. I try to help the sensor out a little bit. If I can throw out an ADA filter, I'll throw that in front. Um, that'll also save you money in post. The closer you get uh, your tungsten to uh, to the daylight sensor means that you're going to pay less in, uh, in noise. Uh, getting rid of noise, you're going to have a tighter color rendering. Um, you're going to have less revisions overall there. Um, figuring out a way to go to 1 over 120, I think is, you know, a great shutter angle. Um, it's tight. You're going to be able to get an okay still image as long as a person isn't running around. Um, you should be able to grab a pretty good still from that. Uh, if you do things that are an F4, um, you'll have considerable depth of field. If you can get it to a 5.6 or an 8, um, you're in the sweet sweet spot. You know, I like to generally have about a foot and a half of depth of field when I'm doing beauty. There's a time when the super shallow depth of field was everything. You know, around the time when this sort of video fashion thing was coming about, you know. Canon 5D, you know, oh my gosh, I can shoot this out of 1.4 and rack focus, and that was that was the deal. And we just racked focus and blurred half of the image, and you know that was that was great for everybody. Uh, but I think that kind of trickery, you know, it it ran its course, and you know, right now we're in a time where people are shooting with highly sensitive cameras, um, and they're shooting out of 5.6. Everything's in focus. Uh, the dynamic range is 14 to 16 steps, uh, stops, excuse me. Um, and you know that particular look. I mean, that's that's very current. So I think sort of with these settings, you can you can get pretty close to that. Uh, evaluating the camera. I mean, that's key. I mean, you know, do you have to shoot on a red? Can you shoot on A7S? I spoke to that. Um, my preference, if I'm doing things on red, I like to do things at a five to one. End up ends up at an eight to one or fourteen to one if I'm doing high speed, um, or you know, if I have the need to also do you know use a weapon and have. Uh, have ProRes proxies. Um, I spoke a little bit already to some of these tech, you know, tech considerations. What we're delivering in is a 4K. Do we have to punch in? Being able to punch in is a great tool, huge time saver. Not reframing. If you can frame a little bit loose, you can shave an hour or more off of your day going back and forth with the art director over, uh, 
you know, over whether or not the composition is perfect. And especially when it comes to shooting faces, I mean, every, every moment counts. I mean, if, when, when I have on, you know, my 24 to 290 lens, uh, it can, it can be a beast, you know, constantly tilting up, tilting down, just, 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 just to maintain my perfect composition. Cause I'm shooting mascara. Sometimes I just like to loosen up a bit, you know, and get it about right and focus more on directing my talent than on making sure that the camera operator is getting precisely the, the, the right framing. Um, not only that, but once, you know, once your client understands that, oh, okay, you know, we can make a, we can make an adjustment, you know, in post, they all kind of chill out and they'll let you go about your day. And again, the biggest cost on any given project, are, it's always overtime. You know, you can sit there, you do the overtime math before. What, what will happen if I run an hour? on everybody's labor. What'll happen if I run a few more? If you want to save a lot, a lot of money also, don't hire anybody. Get like one assistant. That's a great way to do things. I mean, products, if you're working with a lot of equipment, that's just merely impossible unless you can carry 10 tons yourself. Um, but, you know, labor, overtime, it plays in. Go late on a stage, no bueno. So ultimately it comes down to what I believe are sort of the keys to making a great image and saving money while doing it. Starts out with a compelling subject. If you can get exactly who your audience is looking for, uh, if that's whatever social media star, skip it. Give them an iPhone, put them in the bathroom, make sure they're wearing the right earring. You're good. Um, if you're dealing with more sophisticated audiences, you know, that was mean. Okay, if you're dealing with audiences that require a little bit more, uh, a, you know, a different subject, I mean, it comes down to it again. Trying to find the right person who, you know, speaks to the aspirations of the brand. Um, Finding the right setting, uh, getting a cool place to shoot is everything. I mean, nice background, but <laughs> but it literally it literally it literally is everything. Uh, if you can shoot at Versailles, shoot at Versailles. Um, an excellent setting with controllable tones, with a palette that that you know works with your references is everything. There are great spots around the city. Uh, the sanitation, the new sanitation building on Canal Street on the West End, it's just white concrete. Geometrically, it's beautiful. Nobody's ever there. You can get great fashion done there. No problem. Um, you know, make sure that the fashion itself is compelling and the beauty itself is compelling. I mean, really, you know, when some people say, okay, so what is, what is fashion photography? And I say, well, I mean, I think it says it in the name. It's fashion photography. When people shoot a naked girl in high heels. No, not really fashion photography. That's not why it's interesting. What's interesting is the clothes. If you get the right clothes, you can put them on anybody. Really, I mean, okay, you need to have a great model, but if you have like truly interesting clothes, if you have the, you know, the privilege to work, you know, something that's couture, uh, you can, you can actually do a lot by finding a person who you would not consider to be a model wearing them. Sometimes it works for you. Sometimes it makes a great campaign to pick the wrong person. You know, when it comes to finding something new, it's hybridization. One of the things you can do is you can find a guy who is distinctly a cowboy, always been a cowboy, put him in a suit. Already something is just a little bit off. It's like a completely rustic guy, you know, wearing Hugo Boss. What does that say? You know, it's different than Alex. Um, so finding, you know, a, a compelling fashion can mean everything. And when it comes to the beauty, it's the same thing. I mean, there's, you know, there's editorial beauty and, you know, that really speaks for itself when you can do a lot with makeup, a lot with color and, you know, kind of go overboard in the face. You know, that makes for a great image. I love doing that. When you're working with, you know, a more conservative brand or a Clinique or something like this, who wants to, wants to show the actual products the way they actually may appear on screen. Uh, there's a lot to be said about having the best makeup artist. Usually the brand is going to provide that and require that anyway. Do that because liquid eyeliner can be applied very well and very poorly depending on who's doing it. And when it's done well, uh, you can have a, a, you know, a, a, an amazing image. Simplify your lighting, simplify your camera. So when it comes to being cheap, I say it's not about being cheap. It's about being very focused, being very clear about what you seek to create. That's it.
All right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I would just say for somebody who's looking to kind of get into fashion film on a smaller budget, obviously you laid down, laid out the steps that they would take, but what type of project should they start with to increase the odds that they'll make something that's compelling? I think the best thing that anybody can do if they want to uh, get a foothold, if they want to do it the, to do it themselves, it's going to come through your subject. Um, getting access uh, to, you know, a recognized figure is everything. It'll do a lot for you. Um, if nothing else, it'll get eyes on your work and it'll build trust with the brand. So think about how much time you spend researching the right camera, researching the right tools, the location, your amazing concept, your amazing idea. Clock those hours. Then think about what would happen if I really looked through my network, everybody that I know, and gained access just even for an hour, for a few minutes to, you know, a recognized figure. And do what you can. I mean, if you got to get in there with your iPhone and just say, you know, so-and-so, you freestyle for me just for a minute. You'll be surprised what that does for you. You really will. Um, the next thing... I would recommend um, is to find a great mentor uh, who who you um, who you work under can take you a long way. And I often like to just kind of track the careers, uh, you know, of, of other folks and sort of see what paths they took. And quite a lot of them worked for other great people for a while or for a short term, but um, under you know, under that guidance made it far and also made the contacts. So that's what I would recommend. Careful on the spending. I do not recommend that people go out and purchase, you know, cameras that purchase, you know, equipment, purchase lighting. If they haven't already worked out this, you know, the long-term game plan. First of all, your equipment, no matter what you get, it's going to be worthless soon. And it's going to be limiting. There's no one camera fits all. Uh, but having the right subject on your reel or having worked for the right person, that could really be a career changer. Uh, okay, I'm uh, from another field, I'm a photographer, mm. and I just came here in New York and tried to figure out how, how it's work here. Mm. Uh, and one question, maybe it's not a question, maybe it's advice uh, from you, how to find this right mentor, mentor uh, whom you talk uh, mm. previous, and how to write, uh, how to find it. How to find the mentor. Yeah. You know, I wish I had an answer for that. Uh, <laughs> I wish I did. It It comes down to really your own social network, um, trying to get an introduction. Uh, you're, it is very difficult to just email info at so-and-so.com, um, but sometimes they respond. Uh, I actually had you know, a great partnership for years uh, with a person, a photographer, who, you know, I just thought, hey, you know what, this guy and I, we have a similar style. You know, I'm not a photographer. Um, he's a very successful photographer. And I thought, you know what, we should work together. And I did do the info at him. And, you know, I was already a, a bit along, so his people responded to it. But generally speaking, you know, Facebook network, I guess, I'm not exactly sure how Facebook works. LinkedIn, you know, will show connections. That's a great way to do it. Um, asking around, uh, sometimes you'll find that it's not always so straightforward and you'll find that people are protective of their connections, but you might find out that somebody, you know, who doesn't have a reason to be protective could be the one to make you that introduction. Um, but that's kind of the only way it's, it's really going to work for you. Has been. Um, you mentioned before about kind of going with the 
the iPhones and kind of the really cheap cameras. Do you think that's kind of a way to go for people starting out now mm-hmm. and potentially really try to get good with those tools? And mm-hmm. then if you could do it with those tools, then if you were able to get even a, a bigger budget, then all of a sudden you'd probably be in a better position, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, for a number of reasons. The first of which is, you know, keep in mind that you are a business. And, you know, until you have, you know, revenue, you should be careful about your spending. Otherwise, you're not going to be a business for very long. Um, go ahead and survey the market. See what people are looking at. What people look at most? Video of cats and dogs. Okay, fine. That's annoying. <laughs> After that, celebrities. After that, really, really compelling people, compelling subject matter. Ask yourself how you can be a part of that. If you're just thinking, you know what, I, I think I'm just going to shoot, you know, a guy or a girl in this light. Uh, save it. Save it, man. Go to Vimeo. Look at the bucket of millions of people that are doing that. And look at their all other 54 views. Nobody cares. Waste of time. Waste of money. Figure out how you're going to shoot something that's awesome. I'll give you a good cheat. Go to a concert. Go to a concert, bring your iPhone. There are wild people doing wild things. Get them to consent. And you can start out getting great images. Because what's happening is you're getting people behaving outside of their element. People doing something that's simple, you know, that doesn't doesn't require script, doesn't require planning, pre-production, you know, tools, anything like that. Sometimes, and you get people experiencing true emotional moments. You know, the imagery that I don't get to create very often, but I always wish, I wish I could create more emotional imagery. And sometimes when you get people just in the moment at a concert, it can be amazing. Shoot in slow motion on your phone. You can go far with that. The next thing to keep in mind is that if you're really getting started and you don't have an understanding of lighting, tools can trip you up. Tools trip me up all the time. Right? And when I'm overwhelmed with the technical uh, requirements of a project, I, you know, I'm like, oh, wait, there's somebody on the other side of that lens I need to be talking to. And you know, there's the simplest form of an idea that I promise to execute. But I'm too busy, too busy messing with these fangled contraptions you know, to understand what I'm really here for. So be careful about that. Get something that you know how to use that's just like your arm. You know, do it. Uh, don't let it get in your way. Understanding lighting comes from understanding how simple light can be. I got so annoyed in college when they made us light an egg. Just why? But I understood why. Because it was the best way to just get an understanding of highlight, midtone, and shadow. And there is no simpler object that you can get. And it translates directly into how you shoot a face. If you just take one light, one unit, put it on a person, try it up high, try it down low, bounce it off the wall, just the one unit, don't spend a dollar on a second unit, you'll forward you know, your understanding of lighting quite a bit. And in tough situations, when you need to make decisions and you've got all the money in the world, you'll find that you know, the same strategies that you employed when you had no resources you know, come to use. Just last, you know, the other day, um, you know, I was shooting a, a, a very well-funded project um, in studio for, uh, you know, a number of days. And despite the fact that we had a crew of, you know, 50 people and every bell and whistle out there, uh, I came down to, oh my gosh, uh, Marcus, um, right now, uh, we need the drum set to be brighter. And me looking around, realizing that, you know, I was just a notch under overtime, understanding, you know, we were working in a very smoky environment, uh, understanding the way that light works, the way smoke works, um, having worked in, you know, with fog quite often, um, knowing that there is a particular unit in the room that wasn't necessarily, you know, didn't have to be where it was and understanding all I have to do, turn that unit, point it that way, and then that will be done. My ability to navigate that situation just came from me understanding lighting in the simplest form. The alternative could have been, you know, okay, everybody, you know, 15 minutes, we're going to re-rig, we're going to redo this, we're going to reuse our, our, our half million dollars in various tools to get the stupid drum set to work, and in the end, we're all going to be mad at ourselves when we've gone two hours into overtime. Um, so start simple, get a great understanding of that, because it's going to help you at every step.
Cool. All right.